Let's take a look now at the real ACC module. And when I did my original round of testing of Fat Shark Diversity modules, I did not give you a feature roundup of the real ACC. And one reason that I did that is that the features it brings to the table, at least with the stock firmware that comes on it, are not very robust. There's not much to talk about that sets it apart. So in this video, I'm gonna show you the basic features it comes with, and then I'm gonna show you some of the other firmwares you can put on it to enhance its functionality. You can see here uh, the default screensaver of the module shows you uh, your channel you're on, the call sign, and which antenna is currently active. And you can watch it switch back and forth between the antennas as you go. If we go into the menu, we can see that we've got the choice of auto search, which just searches, it, so it's the similar to the spectate mode. As I press up, it'll search for the next strongest channel. And this is useful if you're, if you're I, I find myself using this more than I thought I would, because I, with the uh, with the LaForge, for example, you have the, uh, the favorite channel set, where you can preset the channels you know you're gonna use. But if you're in an environment where you don't necessarily know what channels you're gonna use, that's the, the easiest way to find a pilot uh, to whatever channel they're on. And it's really pretty quick to just jump in there, do auto search, press up, and if you're not looking at the pilot you want, then just go up again. Now you can see what it did there, and they all do this, by the way, not just the real ACC, where when it locks on here, I'm on 5740, you can see it's caught on to 5732, and if I go up, it will slowly and eventually, then it'll go to the next one. So sometimes you gotta hit the up button a couple times to get it to go to the next channel, but it does. it works pretty well. So that's spectate, or auto search. We've got a band scanner, which is exactly the same as all the others. Super useful for finding what channel somebody's on if, if they don't know or if you don't know. And we've got manual mode, which lets us step between them, you know, manually. Again, same as the others. Diversity lets us select auto, receiver A, or receiver B. So if you want to manually select an antenna and disable the diversity, you certainly can do that. And this is actually something, this is one feature that the real ACC has that I, I'm, the, the, the LaForge and the Trudy, I'm 99% sure, don't have. So there you go. There's one unique feature. Personally, I don't, I don't see a strong case for it uh, because unless you're doing some kind of testing, right, where you want to test one antenna or the other. But there you go. You can disable diversity if you prefer. And... Then we get to the setup menu. In the setup menu, we have the option to do uh, the channel order or frequency order, beeps on or off, change the call sign, and calibrate the RSSI. Make sure you calibrate the RSSI on all of these when you first get them, otherwise diversity will not work properly. And you can look on the internet. There are many good videos on how to calibrate the RSSI. So how do you use this then if you, like were this, if this was your daily module that you had in your goggles, how, how can we imagine you using this? Well, for whatever channel that you prefer, so for example, if we do auto search here and we'll get to 5740. No, no, get there. There we go. If you press down the button and hold it in, it will save that. Auto seek mode, 5740, and there you go. So what you might do is just leave it in auto seek mode. It'll power up on 5740. And then when you want to find the next one, who cares what frequency they're on? You just press up to go. Oh, you're going to have to press up several times. Each time you lock onto a signal, you'll have to press up two or three times to get to the next one instead of having, instead of just jumping straight to it. So it's a little less convenient, but for half the price or less of a LaForge, maybe for some of y'all, it would be worth it. I pointed this out in my wrap-up review of all of the diversity modules I had tested to the point of when I did that. But I also want to, you to note, you see how the screen is kind of floating here? This is a hardware issue that LaForge ran into with V1, and this is basically the same hardware design that this thing is copying, or, or LaForge was copying. I don't know. Let's not go there. But this is the same as LaForge V1, and you can see that if you accidentally push on the screen here when you're trying to insert the module or install your 3D printed door, crack, the door, the, the, the screen will crack. Now that screen can be replaced. And in fact, I believe that the screens that UBAD sells for the Forge V1, they can go on here. I've, I've read on some of the forums that they are compatible and they will go on here. And UBAD actually sells a screen with a pre-installed metal cover. So if you do crack your screen, you could get the one from a UBAD with a metal cover on it and save yourself the trouble of doing that. You can also buy a metal cover from UBAD and I believe it will install on here and help protect the screen. So this is an example of the kind of thing that when you buy from a vendor like UBAD, they've already figured these things out and, and have a solution in mind. 
Now, you could also, you could rebut that by saying, yeah, but UBAD had the same problem with their V1. When you factor in the cost of this kind of thing, you say, okay, well, I'm going to pay whatever, 50 bucks for this, and then I'm going to pay 10 bucks to put the, uh, the, the cover on, and et cetera, et cetera. And there's a person out there who would be, love that, and there's a person out there who would rather just have it all already done for them. And which of those people you are <laughs> will help factor into whether this is the right receiver module for you. So now let's update the firmware on the real ACC to something better. And there are several different firmwares you can choose from. This is an open source project, so there's multiple people working on it. I have decided to go with the GC9N firmware. Uh, you can also get the firmware from Shea Ivey. Shea Ivey is the original developer of the RX5808 project. He was hired by UBAD to work for them on the LaForge. So the 5808 basically became the LaForge. Uh, for those of you who are concerned about uh, open source and public licensing, I'm not going to go deeply into that, but suffice it to say that the license that he, the project was originally released under allowed him to do that. So there's nothing sketchy going on about that. You might not like the fact that he went to work for a closed source, but he didn't actually violate any contract terms. So set that aside. So you can get the Shea IV firmware if you like. There's the GC9N firmware. And if you go to this thread, there's also a guy out here. His, he goes by the handle Dexterbot. He is a coding freak. He is codes up a storm. He codes so fast, I can't even keep up with him. And I, his firmware actually has a lot of functionality that the other ones don't have. But it also strikes me as a little bit less user-friendly. So, like, you got to hold the button down, and then the menu will scroll, and you release the button to select the item. But then if you uptick, it's – anyway, it strikes me as a little bit more full-featured but slightly less user-friendly. So that's not the one I'm going to be installing here in my video because I try, I'm going to try and show you something that's a little more suitable for a general audience. But you could use the same process to do – to flash whatever it is that you want to flash. And we want this file – rx5808 pro diversity gc9n.ino.hex. Now let me tell you a little bit more about this while that downloads. So I'm going to click on it, and you'll see I've clicked on it. I've gone to this web page, and then the next thing you got to do, this is just a GitHub thing. Once you click on it, you then click raw, and then you get this, and then you do right-click save as, and then finally, there you go. Now we are done. Now I can save it. No, I've done that wrong. Sorry. You can see here. Let me just resize this window. I've done that wrong because it's being saved here as a text document, which is not what I want. I want it as just .ino.hex. That's what I want. It's not a text document. Okay, now I've done it correctly. An INO file is an Arduino sketch or Arduino program, but using Arduino to flash a firmware can be really tedious and not everybody likes to do it. It's a little bit of a hassle, especially if you don't already have Arduino on your computer, like me, because I'm a nerd, right? An INO hex file is a file that you can more easily flash without having to deal with Arduino or anything like that. And you flash an, a hex file or an ino.hex file using a program called Xloader. So the next thing you're going to need to do is you're going to need to go to this URL. And yes, I will put the URL down in the video description for all you people who don't like to Google, you're going to need an FTDI cable. Now, an FTDI cable, it just looks like a cable with a USB connector on the end that you plug into your computer, but it's not. It's got a special chip in there, and it lets you talk to these devices, okay? So you're going to need an FTDI cable. If you have an Arduino, you can use the Arduino as an FTDI adapter, and if you're the kind of person who wants to do that, you can Google it. I'm not going to go into that. We're going to go to the folder where Xloader is. You downloaded it. You put it somewhere. You took it out of its zip file and you put it on your desktop or wherever. You're going to run it as administrator. Some instructions I found did say you had to use run as administrator. I got it to work other times without just by double clicking it. I don't know. And Xloader will appear. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to go and find that hex file that we downloaded. Here it is. We need to select for device, do a Milinove slash nano, ATmega328. And we're going to pick the COM port that the FDDI adapter is on. In this case, that's COM5. And we're going to leave the baud rate at 57600. I'm going to take just a regular uh, pin header here, and I'm going to stick it in here like so. And then 
I'm just going to insert those pins into the header here, making sure that I put the ground on the right side. Ground goes here. I'll just insert those and I'll hold them in place and the board should power up. Now the board is, oh, see, I'm going to have to keep holding it or it will power down. There we go. So I'm going to keep holding it and I'm going to click upload here and the board should re should power cycle and then the code should upload. Oh, good sign, good sign. <laughs> but it was not a good sign. I didn't get it to work. Well, I did get it to work. Uh, I downloaded the actual Arduino INO file from GitHub and I opened it up in the Arduino development environment and then I downloaded the library files that you need from a second web and a third website and I put the library files in the right folder and I made sure that my library directory was configured correctly in the Arduino and then I went to compile it and it wouldn't compile because there's something you have to change in one of the library files, a parameter that isn't right for this for the real ACC and then I finally got it to compile and I finally got it to upload and the firmware had a bug in it. There was something wrong with it. Uh, I, you might need to do the EEPROM erase before you see. And frankly, these are the kind of hoops that you end up having to jump through with the real ACC. Um, and why some people are going to say, I'd rather just spend the money up front, the 80 bucks for a True D or the 100 bucks for a LaForge or whatever it is. And just get something that comes with the freaking features I want on it. And, uh, you know, the busier I get uh, in this hobby, the more value I place on my time and the less value I place on my money. <laughs> uh, so for those of you with more time than money, uh, then the real ACC is, is potentially a strong choice. As I mentioned earlier in this video, there are several different firmwares out there. Uh, GC, the bug that I reported... The GC9, the developer, he's he's fixed it, and then another one was found, and he fixed that one, and it's just an ongoing process of improvement. He's added features. Even in the time since I uh, started making this video, uh, he's added features, and they keep getting added. It's fantastic. Uh, the functionality is is very strong, and uh, the functionality of the, the Dexter bot is, is, is crazy good if you can figure out what Dexter is talking about, which half the time I can't. And then occasionally it seems like he'll say, everyone's stealing my ideas. I'm not working on this anymore. You guys can have it. And then he'll change his mind and come back. And, and there you go. If you are going to flash a firmware to your real ACC, another one that is worth your consideration, and this one is not on the real ACC thread. It's actually brand new, and the developer has just reached out to me uh, within the last week and said, hey, I just developed this, and I thought you'd think it was cool. Uh, the guy's name is Gel Lecomte. I'm sure I've mispronounced it, for which I apologize sincerely. Uh, and and the goal is with this one is to just keep it simple, but still add some of the sort of killer features that the more sophisticated firmwares have added. So these are all firmwares you can check out. Um, I'll put links to them down in the video description, or you can check out the RC Groups thread and read about them and, and go hog wild flashing them. But be aware that there are some hoops you're going to have to jump through. I found that I couldn't get Xloader to work with the GC9N firmware. If I downloaded the Banggood firmware, then the Xloader that came with it, it would work. But the Xloader I downloaded off that web page I showed you wouldn't work. And etc. So um, there you go. Uh, that's your look at the real ACC. It's a heck of a value at, at around 50 bucks. Uh, and, and if you like trying different firmwares, the development is out there, lots of different stuff. The feature set, it, you know, I was going to say it's, it could be on par with the other firmware, well, like, like with LaForge, which to me, I think is the gold standard at this time in terms of just sort of usability. Uh, but it's, it's kind of not on par. All of the other ones, I find that them to be deficient in some way, at least one way. Maybe I just like I'm just happen to like the LaForge. It seems to strike the right balance of functionality, simplicity, etc. And uh, and I haven't really, I'm on LaForge 1.7 and haven't really felt the need to upgrade from there. So there you go. Thank you for watching. Happy flying.